Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 149. Story 1. Shape of the Void. There was always something about life in the city. The shape of the towering structures that surround you. Not unlike dense towering trees surrounded by a dense mist of fresh air. The absence of natural shapes stings the eyes. The breeze that glides off the surfaces of these windowed monoliths is sharp. Every point where two walls meet into a sharp corner felt out of place. Continuous flatness, yet stopping at every angle, violently redirecting its non-shaped surface. Yet everything perfectly placed for humans to touch. Everything meant to guide you. There is no exploration, no sense of misdirection. Even if you were to get lost, you never ended up in a place where nothing is. The streets guide you in their desired direction. Every guardrail serving to stabilize each step you take, each stair step perfectly spaced to assure you never stumble. Signs in the streets crowd where the sky would be seen to make sure you are never where you aren't supposed to be. Yet it never felt like you were meant to be standing in that place. The unnerving feeling of unnaturalness is further accentuated when the sun hides away, bringing in the night. Streets now empty, sidewalks devoid of the bodies meant to walk over them. The traffic that packed the streets now lay barren. Where the shadows that would be cast by the towers, now, pure darkness. During the middle of the night when all are now asleep, walking through the streets feels unwelcoming. As if I was not supposed to be there. These shapes that meant to guide me, now shaded in darkness only confuse the eyes. My absence from the labyrinth will be forgotten in time. After a few days, it will be as if I never stood there, my presence that once was perceived by the passerbys will gone, as if I was never there, leaving no marks of my existence. The labyrinth will not remember me. As the raindrops merge on the windows of the moving bus I pull my hand within my sleeve to wipe down the condensation blocking my view. Past the falling rain I can draw out the figure of a cabin among the trees. My new home is waiting for me. Away from the daily routes planned for me by the signs and the guidance of the straightness of the sidewalks that led me to my destination like a train on tracks. The sound of the bus making its way over the old unkempt roads have been the only sound inhibiting my mind. The only thing resembling a guide was the one sign we passed days ago welcoming me to a town whose name I've already forgotten. The coldness of the air-conditioned cabin of the bus paired with the warmth of my thick olive coat gave me a sense of peace. It's been a lonely journey, the bus had been empty since the last stop before entering town. My only companion being the single book bag filled with the few things I kept after leaving behind all the unnecessary things that had anchored me to my life in the city. As the journey continued, the trees became denser, the road felt less and less paved. The bus stops. Hey kid, this is the last stop, no more road past this. The bus driver gripped the mechanism opening the door, he made a pointing gesture, directing me to get off. Walking down the steps I mutter one last thank you before turning my back to embrace the cold but inviting breeze that pushed against my face. Before the door closed I heard the driver clear his throat to get my attention. Ain't much to do here kid, just trees, holes in the ground and a lot of nothing else. This bus only comes down this far once every two weeks, so keep your head screwed on tight till I stroll by again if you plan on going back. I nod my head to him. I'll keep that in mind. Walking farther past the last step, I feel the mechanical doors close behind me, signaling that it's past the point of no return. I turn to watch the bus leave. The fog ate it up as soon as it takes off, only seeing the bright red tail lights peering through the mist, even so they too would disappear. The droning sound of the engine that once filled my ears now suddenly vanish. The grey clouds that blanket the sky left not one space open for the sun to shine through, this place was shadowed by a gloomy atmosphere that for some reason felt comforting. It's quite. 
Even under my weighted blanket in my compact concrete room in my apartment I've never experienced such a silence. Before me was a dilapidated metal bus stop. Its bench meant to serve as a place to rest while the bus arrived was now overgrown with moss. The metal overhanging structure now lay in rust, and vines gripping its way up the columns. A few feet past the bus stop the sidewalk comes to a complete end. The structure of man, made to guide your way and steady your pace now ceased. Past this was dense trees, all covered with moss and the floor littered with massive rocks. This is it, past this point there is no more guide to my steps. Each new step I take will be one made with my own direction, not steered by a shape. No destiny written ahead of me. It frightened me as much as it invited me to walk forward. I looked up past the tree line and I could just barely see the shape of something unnatural in the distance. After hiking through the low-hanging branches and the dew-covered mossy stones of this forest I arrive at my first reminder of what I once left. Before me stood an old-looking cabin. Perched on top of what appear to be massive stones. The surface of the walls feel rough, I could sense the curving shape of the logs that made up the structure. Its roof covered in moss. Dripping with water collected by the mist settling within its roots. Even though it was man-made, it felt as if it was a part of the forest. Like if given enough time this structure could form on its own through the process of nature choosing where it grows. Making my way in the inside feels welcoming. Across from the entrance was a fireplace made of the same stones found outside. Walking across the floors I expected to hear the creaking of the wood, yet all that could be heard was the echoes of my footsteps bouncing around the empty space between the floor and the ground beneath the cabin. After settling in and tidying up the place it felt more at home. Although I won't be spending much time here. Not too far from here there is a cavern that I read about on the internet that is doing tours at this time of the season since the waters are frozen and the chances of the caves flooding are low. There was always something about caves that interested me, it's the farthest one can go within nature. The curiosity of exploration had pulled me here as if I was yanked by a leash around a collar. Even though its depths strike a sense of fear within me, the pull of the void was always greater than the fear. The same pull that drove me to where I stand now. The first night had passed. Now as I woke I got everything ready to make my trek to the cavern tour. The morning was quiet. The mist pushed against the cold glass of the window trying to make its way in through the cracks. As I pack my bag I get this unnerving feeling of worry. I get this pull that leads my outside the cabin. Almost as if my subconscious heard a noise outside it wanted to investigate. I find myself standing on top of a stone outside the cabin. The pull is gone. Yet I still feel that unsettling feeling. Before I can take in the nature surrounding me, I feel the stone begin to tremble as if in fear. The ground shuffles slightly but a low rumbling can be heard below my feet. It was a quick tremor that ended as suddenly as it appeared. After I went back to the cabin for my gear I got that sense of worry again. But alas I persisted through that feeling and began my hike to the cavern tour. I don't consider myself a superstitious person. Luck was always something I thought of as mere coincidences that happened to coincide with your intentions or defying your path. In the distance I can see the tour shack of this cavern, ecstatic to embark in my journey away from the outside shapes, yet as I draw closer to the shack, I notice the crowd of people standing, waiting along wearing disappointment on their faces and I can't help but feel anything but unlucky. Among the small group of others wishing to go down this journey I spot out a young woman in a uniform. I approach her wondering what's going on. Hey. Did I make it in time for the tour? The young blonde woman turns to me wearing a worried look on her face. She lets out a sigh before confirming my suspicions of bad luck. Sorry, we were just about to start the tour but, t there was a quake and the entrance has caved in. It's gonna take days to get crews here to lift all these rocks out of the way, and who knows if the rest of the cave inside also collapsed. There it was again, that pull. Something within me pulling me down, anchoring me where I stood. And then, 
the stone upon which I stood cowered in fear again, trembling. But this time, more intense. The small group standing in front of what was once a cave entrance all stood apart from there in fear that more stones would fall. Then it stopped. Story 2. Shape of the Void. Part 2. The tree swaying from the violent shaking, now calming down into a smooth rustling. The wind howled as we all stood there wondering what had happened. The tour guide had advised us all that we would have to leave. I was disgruntled that I had come all this way only for the earth to deny me. Telling me I was unwelcome in its depths, undeserving of exploring its veins. Almost as if telling me to return to Labyrinth of Man, and wallow in its room of edges. On my trek back to the cabin I felt an unnerving feeling that I had felt once. Even though I was deep within the forest. Hopping and skipping on seemingly randomly placed stones and low-hanging branches, I felt that familiar feeling of walking on a sidewalk. That feeling that the path I'm walking is leading me by the hand, not straying off of it. The randomness of the forest somehow felt as if each stone I was stepping over was placed there for me to walk over, like the slabs of sidewalk. And every low-hanging branch I held onto so I didn't slip was lowered to my height like a rail to steady myself. Why did I feel this way now? There are no man-made shapes here in the density of the forest but the familiarity of the proximity of it all made my stomach feel uneasy. I used to believe that destiny was a lie. That you are where you are supposed to be at this very moment. That where you will end up has already been decided by forces outside of your control. How preposterous to think that you are not at the helm of your own fate, is it not? I decide my path. Where I go in this world is only up to me. To believe that the stones beneath my feet have always been waiting, millions of years for me to bear my weight upon them at this very moment, all culminating towards what? To believe that a tree which has been growing for hundreds of years grew this branch so that I may have something to grab so I don't slip on this rock covered in the dew of the mist. And now that I did, what? Is its purpose fulfilled? I never believed anything so presumptuous as that these things were arranged in this way to guide me in my destined path. But now, all that I used to believe has been put in question. As I stand here before where my cabin used to stand, now just rubble of stones. Where the massive stones that was the foundation of the old cabin once was, had slid down the hill they were perched on, and the cabin in thousands of pieces mixed with the small stones at the bottom of the hill. As I approach the base of where those stones once were I'm struck with that feeling once more. The pull. Among the stones and moss now lay in the open the entrance to what seems to be a deep hole. Not steep enough to fall in but just at the right angle as though you can enter with ease. The mist surrounded me as I stood peering into the descending abyss before me. I held my hand over the opening to see if there was air coming out, because that meant there could be an exit somewhere else. Yet I felt nothing. The mist that had settled over the ground began to be pulled into the opening. As if the earth was taking its first breath. The mist gliding down the stepped ripples of the walls as if unrolling a carpet for me to walk over. I could not escape this feeling. The call of the void was tugging at my neck to go in. Even though I knew it was a bad idea to go inside a cave that has never been explored, there was something telling me it was supposed to be the one to go in for me to have been lead here. This vein which ended right behind the massive stones that once covered the opening, now finally exposed after I arrived. It's almost eerie to think, that it had opened for me, to be explored and traversed by me and to see what lies at its heart. After equipping the gear I brought along for the cavern tour I slowly began my descent. Each step I took going deeper and deeper felt like the cave itself was guiding me. The arrangement of the walls were always random, yet inexplicably to me there was always somewhere to put my foot on the way down. There was always a little indent in the wall where my hand fit so I could hold onto. As if it was carved out from below all the way to the entrance for me. Yet nothing felt like it was out of place. After meandering through the decent, I reach a flat area where the ceiling opens up. The light from my flashlight can no longer reach the ceiling. 
the light gets lost in the darkness consuming the cave. After pacing forward no more than 20 feet the walls start to narrow again at a point. And at the end of this room there is a small hole. After exploring this room for a few minutes there seems to be no other path but to enter this new tunnel. Not long after the entrance to this cave had opened and the carpet of mist led me down to this room the mist floating just above the floor began to edge closer and closer to the tunnel I was debating entering. As if it was being breathed in by the cave, being pulled in along with me, eager to reach the depths. Reluctant to continue my journey, I stood before the hole, questioning if I should go further. The size of the hole being so low meant I would have to crawl on my knees. I took one look back at the path I had come from, taking one last look at the fading light of the entrance that was far above. While I was looking up at the distant opening which I had come from, I picked up a sound of an echo that came from the small opening. It sounded the scattering of rocks, shuffling about, then silence, and then a faint smack, as if a small rock fell from its place and hit a floor. Such an echo raised the hairs on the back of my neck. Up until now it had been dead silence. Even so, something in me pulled me to go farther. Regardless of the fright beating in my chest, I gathered my courage and persisted deeper within. Now brought to a crawl going deeper and deeper in the tunnel it felt so strange to me. The tunnel went straight forward. It gave me such an unnatural feeling. I had never heard of a cave going straight as if it were a tube and it never shrank or grew. It remained the same size throughout the whole crawl. Had it not been for my light I wouldn't have noticed when it came to a stop, the tunnel ending in an opening to a chasm. The light shone against the opposite wall. I peered down the ledge to see how low it went and it looked like there was no floor, an endless fall awaited me if I chose to go further. My nerves had my hands shaking and I slipped my hand, my book bag flipping over my head and pushing me toward the edge. I managed to get a grip on the floor and hauled myself from falling over the edge. Before I could react, the zipper at the top of the bag had slightly opened and one of the spare batteries for my helmet light fell through the opening, falling into the abyss. My hands were clawing at the edge as if I was still falling. Reconciling my emotions, for a few seconds, I finally heard the smack of the battery hit what I assume was the floor of the chasm. How long was that falling? I look over the edge trying to see if, now that my eyes had adjusted to the darkness, I might see something resembling a floor to what I thought was an endless abyss. Squinting to see past the darkness, I notice something pierce through the dark voice, a faint, little glimmer of light. I did a double take trying to make sense of what I'm looking at. A very hard to notice glimmer of light shining, fighting its way past the dense darkness hoping to be seen. And as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. Now my curiosity had peaked. Could there be some type of gem big enough to reflect my light? Or could it be an exit? Ha! Huh? No way could I get to the bottom of that, there is probably no way down besides to rappel down with rope. Or so I thought. Just as I almost cast aside the guidance the cave had given me this far. I explored the ledge I was standing on, till my eyes met with the flat vertical wall behind me, there was a lower ledge to the side that I could jump down to. And another one. And another ledge. And another ledge. They were so oddly spaced, where it was never so tall that I could get hurt from the fall, but never so closed that it felt like a short step. And yet it felt, natural, not measured with precision and leveled, not cut to be perfectly flat. Somehow I still felt that familiarity. As if this was meant to be the path to take. I continued my descent further for what felt like hours, and always just when I felt like it was a dead end or a drop that I could not cross, there was always a stone placed where I could walk, as if waiting for me to notice it, to continue my journey down. As I stood still there I was hit by a silent whisper of an echo, coming deep within the chasm, sounded like the cave had spoken to me. Calling me down deeper. Calling for somebody to reach its deep floor. I could not shake this tension any longer. My desire to reach the end of this cave became unwavering. I began to trust the cave. 
the journey felt as if it had gone on for so long. Every time I thought reached a dead end, I scoured the walls for direction. And the cave would continue to lead me to my next path. The farther and farther I descend I begin to smell the faint scent of metal in in the air. Almost like if there was iron ore exposed on the walls filling the air with the scent of its rusting. The walls that were once smooth now started to feel rougher as I made my way deeper. I began to feel more jagged edges along the wall and protruding stones piercing through the wall. I had reached a point where the only way forward was through a tunnel so small I was brought to lay flat and crawl on my belly. The cave walls now so rough it felt like sandpaper against my skin as I dragged myself farther along this chute, the ceiling of this tunnel dragging against my back, scratching it as I moved. I managed to reach an opening and as I drag myself out from the small enclosure my body aches from the scratches left by the pointy rocks that were scattered among the floor. The cave no longer coddled me with that welcoming feeling. It began to feel as if I was not being lead by the hand, but dragged by the neck. How many hours had gone by? I could not remember now. I hoped to reach the end of the cave what felt like a few hours ago, but just when I feel like I've reached the last room, or peer over the next ledge, it goes deeper, and deeper. After much meandering, I finally arrived at what I think was the bottom of the chasm that I had peered down many hours ago. I never thought the winding pathways on the way down would lead down here. Almost as if the cave was begging to be explored. My admiration of the wonders of this cave network had been cut short as my ears picked up the sound of rocks scattering above me. Coming from the direction of the ledge where I peered down. And then suddenly I'm startled as I hear a loud smack hit the ground right behind me. Almost like the sound of metal clanging against the stone surface. I quickly jump and turn to face the direction of the noise, frantically pointing the light at the floor trying to locate what it is that hit the ground. My light catches on something off-colored, completely standing out from the dark gray monotone shades of the cavern walls. It was my battery, that had fallen some while ago. But, how? Where did the one that fell the first time go? As much as I looked around the floor there was no other battery around. The first time, what am I talking about, the first time? How did this just hit the ground now? I heard it hit the ground the first time. I aim my light up to see if I can spot the ledge from down here. It's no good. I doubt the light will pierce through the intense darkness. Looking up I notice something. It's barely visible through this consuming darkness above. A small faint glimmer of light. Coming from where the first ledge I almost fell from would be. And then, the light begins to flicker, and suddenly. Darkness. A type of void-like encroaching blackness that deafens even my hearing. In my panic I start shuffling through my bag to find another battery, not realizing that the one that fell was the only spare I had. Now that I find myself lost, wandering in this void, with my balance thrown off. I can no longer remember which direction I came from, I try to walk towards any direction hoping to hit a wall. My heart is beating as if it is fighting to break free from my chest. I'm alone, stuck in this pitch black cave that no one even knew existed until today. And no matter how hard I try I can't see to find my way back. Hello? Someone, please, help me. I whimper out in fear, hearing my voice bounce off the walls of the cave. I follow the echo in an attempt steer myself in any direction, carefully and slowly shuffling forward as to not fall of an unexpected ledge. At last, in my mindless stumbling I hit a wall. The horizontal groves carved out by erosion lead me to what I hope is some type of exit. The texture of the walls becoming more and more jagged and rough to the touch. The grooves lead me deeper down into the cave. I now don't know if I'm going further down, or in a different direction, it's hard to tell, as every rock is different than the last, nothing feels natural anymore, it no longer feels like I'm being held by the hand towards a path of discovery, now it is a desperate wonder unable to make sense of where I should go next. My feet start feeling wet, had the fog which once entered the cave now covered the floor with water? 
My feet began to slosh around the one still puddle of water that covered the floor, but it felt thick. The smell of iron is getting more and more intense, as if I'm surrounded on all sides with exposed or rusting to its core. The air is getting harder to breathe, its toxicity made my lungs feel as though I was being constricted. My hand continues to stumble across the wall of the cave. The walls feeling even more dangerous touch. I struggle to guide myself as I slide my palms across its surface, feeling the small piercing stones make cuts to my palm, yet I don't take my hand off the wall, scared that I would lose myself in this pitch black darkness again and won't be able to find my footing again. I persevere past the searing pain, gliding my hand across the wall hoping I reach another way forward, until I feel it start to smooth out. It gets smoother and smoother, and flatter as it continues until my hand slides off the wall completely, as if I had slid my hand across a glass window. I felt up and down the wall unable to make sense of it. It was perfectly flat. Up until now the walls of the cave had been random and protruding. As if carved by a stream of flowing water. I couldn't make any sense of it. Now I stand here frozen in fear, as my hand reaches what felt like the end of the wall and I'm struck with a deep shiver as I glide my hand up and down the ending of this wall realizing it bends and continues at what feels like a 90 degree angle. A corner. A perfect corner, so sharp I could cut my hand, two walls perfectly flat and smooth as a panel of glass meeting at a perfect corner all the way down to the floor. My fingers reach the floor and dip into the water that had risen to my feet up to the ankles. I bring up my hand to my nose and the smell of iron overtakes my sense. It all clicked. Why the smell of iron intensified the deeper I went, and why my feet felt like they were sloshing around what felt like a stream of water, but heavier and thicker. As the fear of my realization sets in I hear the beating of a heart, not just from my own chest, but now a beating loud enough to overtake my own beat. I put my ear against the wall. I can hear it the faint beating of a heart, pulsating through the compact stone, trembling with each pulse. But how? How can I so clearly hear a heart beat as if it were alive? As the beating went on it started matching my own rhythm. My own heartbeat and the beating coming from the wall had completely synced. And suddenly, it stopped beating. The wall became still again, although I am unable to remove my hand from its surface. I pressed my ear harder against the smooth surface hoping to hear its fading beat. Yet it didn't fade, it just stopped. I felt a weakness take over me, my body no longer able to stand on its own strength, I clutch my chest attempting to take a breath and I come to notice, I cannot feel my own heartbeat anymore. I can't remember what I was chasing down here anymore. What was the pull which had brought me down to this depth? Did I finally reach the end of the cave? I can feel the darkness overtake me. My body now floating over the thick waters, feeling myself getting pulled down. It feels deeper than it was before. My head barely staying above attempting with all my strength to take a breath. As the piercing silence slowly starts to drone out and I sink deeper, it is broken by an echo deep within the direction of the chasm I had come from. Hello. Someone please, help me. End. Story 3. The Dead City. We scale the walls, we burglars of Eden. Once down, we keep to the grass beside the motorway, avoiding the gaze of the dead. We're pretty good at this kind of thing. After all, we've been doing it for years. A long line of cars queue to leave the city. They never will. The spectral occupants' cries of desperation are as airless and silent as the long-emptied horns of their cars. They went unheard by the aloof military long before they stopped making sound. We move on so as not to catch their gaze. I tell the rookie not to disturb the dead, making a joke about road rage. He doesn't quite hear me as he dwells on the site. A city that didn't know it was dead. Mile-high gravestones of glass and concrete pierce the clouds of black and gray, the city's epitaph written across their faces in the braille of broken windows. Dead dreams and the dust of decades. Pale faces in the windows. 
phone calls on networks as dead as they are. Hushed conversations around stagnant water coolers. They don't see us. They only see what they saw back then. I say it to Walsh and the rookie, but mostly for myself. I always have to say it. When clinging to your rifle brings no comfort, cling to rituals. I watch the ghosts flood the streets at nightfall from the relative safety of a rooftop. The river sticks through the static of night vision. The last stampede of the dead but didn't he know it's from those final panicked hours. Distance obscures their details and I'm glad I cannot recognize anyone. Small mercies. I look down at them a moment more, then I turn away as surely as God did. They called it the chills. The kind of cold that seeps into more than just a man's bones. Cold from a place we were never meant to know, distant gates ripped open by the cold engines that gave us power and fuel when the planet gave no more to be burned. So long as they still thrummed beneath the earth, we would never see what awaited us beyond death. Frozen in the mundane limbo of our final moments on repeat. A sickness, a penance for divine trespass. Better to dwell on what we did know. We see a man on a nearby rooftop, throwing himself to his death to escape it. A futile effort, as he appears moments later to begin his attempt anew. Don't feel sorry for him says Walsh. He's been doing it for years. We sleep on the rooftops, always. Safer that way, less foot traffic. But we always have one of us on watch, always looking out for a shadow stepping from a doorway here, a face in the dark there. They make no sound, and so it's our eyes that must remain vigilant. It's my turn tonight, so I drink a kin of energy drink, one of the last of its kind, just like the still living. We burn detritus we gathered at the foot of the building, as much to see the fire exit door as for warmth. The fruity effervescence of the drink perks me up, and I begin to weep gently. I used to look forward to new flavors, but there will be no more. Perhaps it's the caffeine and sleep deprivation talking. I wipe my eyes. They must see clearly. We leave by the stairs. We bump into a ghost in a hurry. We have room to move on the stairwell, but she was quiet and far too quick. They always were. She wears the look of one jolted from a daydream as we bump elbows, and I know that we have to be quick. We exchange a bullet for time before she either changes or shows up again. We should have taken the elevator the rookie says, half joking. Elevators are never a good idea. Within one, a cold shoulder from a ghost is a mercy. A bumped elbow, far less so. I pray he never sees why. I also pray that I have reason enough to stop calling him rookie soon, and throw in a quick prayer for better knees to tackle the rest of the stairs with. We shelter in a supermarket to avoid one of the disturbed. We hold our breath as it moves through the street. A mockery of the human form. Their final routines interrupted, fragile peace in the familiarity of life's habits forever shattered. The dead don't take kindly to interrupted rest. It changes them, turns them into something wrong. The roiling chaos of its shifting awful briefly aligns into something vaguely resembling the structure of a human face. It almost looks like the woman from the stairwell. I hope that I merely imagined it. I look away before my eyes begin to ache. We see an old woman examining her empty hands. Tins of food long looted. We add a few of our own to a shopping cart, careful not to disturb her. A brief glimmer of lost banality. She reminds me of my grandmother. I stuff the food tins and memories away in the cart. From the rooftop I see metal behemoths over the walls. The macro carriers that fed the ever ravenous expansion of the city when it still lived. Colossal cattle grazing concrete pastures, dozens of lanes wide, the grand highways that pend our hubris across vast swathes of the earth. To the west, I see a maw of concrete, big enough to devour the metal behemoths. A military tunnel, cavernous and imposing. Would our treasures be there? The sentry guarding the compound pays us no heed as we trespass. Talk about being shite at his job the rookie jokes. We laugh. 
it might be our last chance to. We stand in the mouth of the tunnel, sheltered from rain, and speak of a bounty of bullets awaiting us. An armory of heaven's army, ripe for the taking. The Stygian depths threaten to swallow us. We're in no position to refuse its call. I'm not defending our cart of food by throwing fucking stones. Walsh leaves no room for argument, for there is none. Our near-empty ammo pouches concur. In unknown depths, flickers of movement. A shadow, a boot. One soldier runs past, no doubt rushing to his feudal quarantine on the outskirts. I want to laugh at how silly they look, how silly they acted even back then. Didn't they know they were infected too? The darkness steadily gives way to grey light. A vast gate, rhymed and humming with profane power. It crackles occasionally, and the light within it bleeds a fog that chills all around it. I feel a fantastic warmth as I step close. Beneath the thrum, I hear the singing of my mother. With every crackling arc, the bark of my first dog. Walsh pulls me back with a warning shake of his head. I walk away shirking free from the hypothermic lullaby. Gateways to cold spaces beyond mortal ken. We were never meant to wander that far. We find a vault, sealed tight. We argue over whether to open it. Sealing something in or out? Coffer or coffin? The cold fog nearby carries lessons abound on where curiosity landed us, but ignorance and greed prevail. Inside, the corralled scientists who peered beyond the cold light in the gate. Driven irreversibly mad, and now, contained no more. They change faster than we can reseal the door. We smell that dreaded sanguine stench and hear their screeching inside our minds, that grating keen that only the disturbed bellow. These ones are different, they shriek in languages without name. Panting, sprinting through the dark and cold. Flailing flashlights picking out others of their kind, drawn from the depths of the facility and blocking our way. We try to fight, but the bullets only do so much and we have so precious few. I see the rookie run through a gap in their ranks, leaving us behind. I finally use his name, roaring a curse upon it as it becomes clear that this complex will be our tomb. Walsh goes down, and my eyes sting too much to see what becomes of him. These blights upon physical space, visual aberrations, bastard glitches in the code of nature. They close around me as my body goes cold, rent apart by fractal bone blades and screeching maws and we scale the walls, we burglars of Eden. Once down, we keep to the grass beside the motorway, avoiding the gaze of the dead. We're pretty good at this kind of thing. After all, this marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. See you until next time.